Hello, everyone. Welcome to our lovely Wednesday webinar with Hire. Um, my name is Kelly McGrath-Smith, for anyone who might be new to us, um, and I'm the Community Director at Hire. Um, Hire is a global TA and HR community. We've got over 11,000 members globally at the moment um, and growing, which is fantastic. The main community lives over on Slack, but we also have these weekly webinars every week on LinkedIn Live. We have in-person events. We have online roundtable events. Um, so lots of good stuff if you are working internally um, in HR or TA. We like to see ourselves almost as the hive mind of Global TA and HR as well. So part of that is being on a bit of a mission to up level and upskill the industry, which is one of the reasons why we love to host these weekly webinars to have fantastic folks from in the community jump on with us, share their insight um, and intel in terms of great topics that we want to chat through. Um, if you don't know Hire, I've just popped a little link below. So HireHQ.com. If you're not a member and would like to find out more, if you'd like to come and join the community um, within the Slack community, we also have lots of sub interest channels that you can get involved with based on topics, based on locations. Um, we kind of appreciate as well that sometimes working in HR and talent can be a little bit of a lonely role, especially if you are in a standalone role or you're leading a team in a startup scale up. Um, so it's a good opportunity to be able to connect with peers and, you know, ask any questions that you might have about, you know, what's going on in your organization. Um, or if you're out of work as well, we have um, channels where we share roles, um, which is, you know, really, really great at this time as well. Um, but but that brings me on very nicely to today's topic. Um, so we're talking all around scaling and sustainability. And I've got two fantastic guests from the community on to chat through. So I will hand over to them to introduce themselves before we kind of jump straight into the topic. And for anyone who is watching, all I would say is, you know, if you've got any questions, comments as we go, please feel free to drop it um, in the chat function as well um, and we will come back to your questions as we go um, but for now Matthew I'll hand over to you first if you wanted to give a little bit of an introduction. Hi yeah thanks Kelly um, so I'm Matthew I've uh, been working in in TA for, for over, well, over a decade now um, my I've recently wrapped up at Procore which was a global software business and I've had the pleasure of working around the world in, in Australia in the UK supporting companies uh, uh, across Europe and, and North America I think uh, India is the only one of the only kind of regions of the world that I haven't I haven't hired in yet uh, and maybe the, the Arctic uh, so I'm really interested to kind of talk about this topic uh, and kind of get into kind of the value and the, the kind of thought process around going global as, as a business and recruiting. Amazing. Thank you. And Nita, I'll hand to you for an introduction now. Oh, thank you, Kelly. And hi, team, for having me today. Um, this topic is very much on top of mind for HR and business leaders. So I appreciate your invitation to share my learnings and perspectives with our audience today. And Matthew, it's great to see you. So we, I'm, I'm excited that we are um, connecting on these topics. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I serve as a global head of talent acquisition at Velocity Global, uh, responsible for end-to-end -end execution of talent acquisition strategy. Um, I want to call my team my high-powered team. Uh, we are dedicated to engaging, um, attracting, hiring, and onboarding at Velocity Global in over 54 countries. Um, and this is to uh, highlight that we bring a diverse community of people who are brilliant at their craft and passionate about borderless teams um, and deeply aligned to our company values. Um, I have led uh, globally distributed talent acquisition teams. Um, it's been, I wanna say, uh, over two decades um, and including talent analytics, research and operations, um, especially in disruptive business environments, including uh, Amazon and Lemonade uh, in my last 10 years. So uh, great to be here. Thanks Kelly again. Amazing. I feel like we've got the two best people to speak on this topic, so it's very exciting for us. Um, well, I guess on that note, let's kind of jump straight in because I know there's lots that we can and, and want to cover in this time. So maybe just to kind of start with, we'll kind of look at it in terms of, you know, why would a business 
want to hire outside of you know their main HQ and maybe how they might go about that. Um, so Matthew, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll hand to you to kick us off on this one. Yeah, for sure. And um, it's also kind of likewise excited to be working with Nita on this topic because we've independently been talking about this kind of a few times. And, and our first time that we ever spoke, we got into this topic in a kind of a lot of detail. So in many ways, this is kind of a coming together and just a recording of, of a great kind of chat that we had a little while ago. Um, but for, I, when I was reflecting on this question, I think there's probably kind of three, maybe four kind of core reasons why why kind of businesses look to hire outside of their, their HQ. Um, so this is either, you know, firstly, part of an active kind of move towards a remote workforce, right? They want to kind of hire without borders and, and think about, you know, accessing a global talent pool. Um, the second would be because it's part of a kind of go to market revenue expansion. So they're looking to break into a new market uh, from a sales perspective or a marketing perspective. Um, the third would have been to look at their cost. Um, so they're looking to reduce their, their cost through uh, identifying a lower cost market to, to hire in and grow their team in. And then I guess the fourth kind of one would be would be an acquisition you know so they've gone and acquired a, a business that's outside of their hq and they're now wanting to kind of expand and grow grow their business um i imagine that predominantly the first three will probably talk about and uh, different types of kind of details and the pros and cons uh of going global etc but i mean imagine nita like you've probably been exposed to that first one quite a bit in in your world i mean would love to hear kind of your your perspective and you know, how you've been able to facilitate, I don't, you know, Velocity Global as well, you know, given everything they do, I imagine they're super familiar with like how you facilitate companies like doing these processes. Yeah, um, you know, great question. And uh, Matthew, I echo with uh, many of the reasons that you uh, that you mentioned, you know, why do we hire outside of our, our local main office or HQ, right? So, um, so I look at this in a in a, a couple of different ways, right? Um, so for every organization and its business strategy, uh, it's un it's going to be unique. And if your company has services or products that serve customers globally, whether it's directly or indirectly, having your presence locally is critical to long term sustainability. So you can continue to delight your customers and be that top player in the marketplace. But today, as Matthew mentioned, I would say globalization, technological advances talent shortages in your own specific area, the socioeconomic climate in a country, and even the rise of the gig economy or the, the labor market characteristics, right? That's ever changing. Um, and also the reskilling uh, or the, the work skill set has the nature of work and the skill set has been, uh, are all key elements contributing to the complexities of addressing and managing uh, when we think about sustainable growth. So with this in mind, we look at the talent availability index, the hiring demand, the universities and schools that feed into these skill sets to support the job types, thus expanding our global footprint by going uh, or uh, leveraging global hiring, correct? Um, but don't let the uh, complexities of global hiring stop you for, from expanding your team in multi-regions to get that diverse perspectives. And I want to talk uh, more about uh, the what is an EOR, an employer of record, which is uh, mm -hmm. Velocity Global does and the, the company I, uh, today I work with, um, where our mission is to create opportunities, borderless, uh, who can make this seamless for you. So with EOR, or uh, what we call it as employer of record, as your partner, where expertise is readily available, uh, Matthew, we are able to navigate or, you know, any business is able to navigate local laws, tax systems, reporting and multi-country payroll. It's all within reach. This was perhaps not uh, possible or in, in many, many cases, HR functions will think almost impossible, you know, 10 years ago or a decade ago. But this actually, these partners give you legal peace of mind, a team of experts and a single platform to simplify global workforce management. So, so that TA or our recruiting teams can tap mm -hmm. into global markets beyond their company's existing hubs. Um, so, uh, you know, I think these are great advantages or, you know, tech platforms that's coming our way, it's, it's in the market. Um, and in addition to just compliantly onboard pay and support talent uh, as part of EOR business, this also, uh, these platforms take care of global immigration. So suppose if you're looking to relocate one of your existing talent to a different country uh, to have that, uh, you know, uh, the, the presence or the, the, you know, continue that company culture aspect. 
um, a global payroll, for that example, or if it, even if we talk about a global equity, um, all of these aspects are managed by um, uh, EOR. And I think it's been like quite interesting to see the emergence of these sorts of platforms over the last kind of few years and how important companies like Velocity Globals are, especially to small and large businesses. You know, I've worked at Procore, we're 5,000 person business and we used an employer record to launch into new countries. But then equally, I was talking with a startup of like 100 people and they're looking to have a number of people on there, uh, you know, via an EOR in North America, for example, because they have found great talent there. They're in the process of relocating, but because they in you know in, in North America you've got two week notice periods they can start really soon which is super impactful to the business um and they wanted to get them on board in such a straight away so they use the employee of records so like it's I would really advocate for considering the role of an AOR and not, not this isn't kind of some sort of advert for it but I, it, they're super important as part of the conversation around globalization and they're one of the many tools in the HR like kind of toolkit for um for our kind of global global expansion. Yeah, and I think I, I think about also, um, Kelly, to our broader topic today about sustainability, mm -hmm. correct? So it's not just about global hiring. What do we, how do we take care of our people uh, globally? And how do we make sure, you know, the, the payroll, the equity, the pension plan, or even a flexible office space, all this, how can we manage this when we don't have our uh, footprint right there yet, right? Um, so I think, uh, this is uh, definitely uh, a game changer in our industry where uh, many companies, whether it's a uh, small size or mid size or enterprise even, you know, um, so it doesn't have to be Matthew, like how you mentioned, you know, whether it's 5,000 or 100 person employed uh, a company, uh, all, all, all these sizes can leverage uh, these, uh, uh, these platforms. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think you make a really good point there around that sustainability side of things. And I think what might be a good point to look at as well is, you know, when you're at that starting point and you know you want to start to hire outside of your main location. And, you know, we kind of spoke there's a kind of EOR options. But when you look at it from like you're at that early stage, what do you need to start to think about to also have that sustainability factor? you know, at the heart of what you're doing so that when you are scaling, when you are entering new markets, you're doing it in the best way possible for your organization. Uh, Matthew, you want to go first or um, sure. I could have a I could have a go. Um, I think there's like, I think partly it depends on where the conversation is being driven from. So mm -hmm. it like, all too often uh kind of the business comes to recruiting and says hey we've got this person over here that we want you to hire make it work or we're like we're starting to uh you know think about hiring over here how how can we do it um and i think e one is kind of obviously very reactive and and it, you know we can then use things like EORs and go down that process but i think the other is a really interesting like when we talk about sustainability is a really interesting conversation um you know there's we talent plays a really important role in driving the talent go to market strategy for a global uh, for a globalization play you know it's how do we look at the eat the right market how do we look at the availability of talent to make sure that we're not kind of you know using resources kind of uh, in an in an inefficient way because as soon as we transition from we want to hire in one market to we want to hire in any market or even multiple markets we all of a sudden are kind of you know doubling or tripling or, or you know or 10xing the size of the market that we're looking to approach from a talent acquisition perspective which doesn't become sustainable from a you know, which which is really hard to break into and hard to manage from a talent, you know, from a talent strategy perspective, which I think we'll kind of go into a bit later. Um, but importantly as well, it's, you know, is there a coherent strategy all the way through the business? You know, it, it has HR been brought into the conversation? Are the business leaders and their managers uh, who are going to be managing people in different countries aware of kind of what they might, you know, are they kind of on top of what should be expected in hiring a remote employee that might come from a different place that might have a different language that they, you know different working hours etc what is the expectation and i think it's important to bring together hr as one voice in these conversations to say look these are all of the kind of things we need to consider before we make a snap decision and all too often we see businesses at lots of different sizes going snap let's we want to hire in this country all of a sudden um or we want to hire you know we want to go fully remote and we saw that during covid but the repercussions of that can be quite severe um so it's important to come into it with yeah with one voice what, what would you say nita 
You know, I, I you no, know, I, I, I agree with you, and and I, you mentioned uh, the word uh, reactive, uh, and I want to connect that to today. There are many platforms available, right? To for us for TA to be reactive. Hey, can you go find talent in a certain country where we have where the business has not been operating, right? So it's very much easier in terms of access. Mm -hmm. To that talent, but I want to, uh, yeah, uh, uh, and I, I want to come back to the the uh, the comment you made about, you know, do we have all the players to make this a uh, a thoughtful strategy, right? Uh, are we preparing this ahead of time instead of just going and hiring someone, uh, um, a new talent or new hire in a in a new country? So it, it becomes very monumental to make sure that there are a couple of key factors that I would consider when we start to think about hiring beyond our HQ or, or our main office is we, we seek to drive change in talent acquisition practices. And when, when we take it to global hiring, it's very closely tied to diversity, social issues, sustainability, and more so creating that sense of belonging. Uh, Matthew, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier remote as, as such, right? Uh, what we need is a more diversified leadership at the top, at the very top. Uh, we also need, the, of course, the insights and exp uh, strength that comes with experience from, uh, from our executive leadership team. And I think the second piece is about culture, a strong workplace, uh, workplace club culture, because um, I, I look at it as employing those with different backgrounds and in, in let's say, in life expertise and career spe specialties. Positively, yes, of course, it contributes to a healthier culture. Um, and, you know, as TA professionals, recruiting can be very intentional and purposeful, uh, but it is imperative to define and build a workplace culture which empowers employees because that recruit or new hire or candidate is actually our employee. And we want to encourage them to invest in their future in our organization and is, and is flexible. So when I think about it, even in times of changing business climates and economic stress, I think about opportunities to develop and improve company culture, which is very pivotal to when we think about global hiring. Uh, and it'll definitely help us overcome unexpected challenges and success long term. You know, how are we making sure that uh, our employees have the, uh, the the career development? And, you know, in, in many ways, they also are looking for uh, fulfillment, right? So what can the company or what can our organization or the business um, offer our uh, new hires? I like that term intentionality like it it it's so easy to fall into a trap of like trying to hire your first person trying to reduce your cost somewhere expand into a new market and if your culture isn't built with a remote mindset uh, and you know, people aren't aware of how they might need to change their behaviors I, I joke about this quite a lot I used to I used to I've worked in many US based businesses and I was often in one of the first cohorts of their hires outside of their outside of the US and they would have European based conversations to talk about the EMEA strategy, but they do it at 9 p.m. at night when they were all free, but 9 p.m. my time. <laughs> um, and I was like, well, if we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, a European strategy. Maybe we should put it within European hours. And even just kind of small things like that are kind of cultural, massive cultural shifts for businesses if they've been used to operating in a, in a certain way for such a long period of time. And if we are not thoughtful about that as we, as we expand our workforces outside of our HQ, we will we will kind of disassociate ourselves and and um, you know, remove ourselves from those folks. They won't feel included. And they won't be invested as part of this kind of business that we're trying to build. Yeah, really good points. And I think we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that kind of remote first piece as well. And I see we've got a question in the chat about that, so we'll we'll absolutely come on to that. But I think kind of to your points, when we are looking at that expansion piece and we're looking at TA specifically you know what sort of conversations do TA need to be having with the organizations at this point and maybe you can give some examples of you know your own experiences in these areas and kind of you know how you've had to handle any of those maybe challenging conversations where you are expanding somewhere where you know there's different notice periods there's different laws there's a whole host of different things to look at um Matthew I'll, I'll go to you to start this one if that's okay mm. ah, so, so many uh examples I think I mean just from like a base basic kind of perspective when we're um, a broker a lot of the stuff we're talking about is trying to educate the business around like how 
the employment laws differ from just within the European Union because I think you know depending on where you are in the world there's a kind of a perspective that it's like sort of like a state system uh, in in Europe and that it's broadly speaking follows the same you know same kind of approach so just as one example we were trying to uh, we had a conversation understanding why our times of hire numbers or time to start numbers were so long in comparison to the US where we had like 50 days time to start in the US but it was 60 70 days in 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 the uk and we had to show them using data in, in workday that it was our it was a notice period purely notice period that all of the kind of actual funnel metrics that were happening within our company were the same um it was just the fact that our that the notice periods are longer and that was how we kind of educated them not kind of just taking us by rotes that we would say that the notice period is, is a month because they just couldn't believe that that especially in the context of a talent of what they deemed a you know talent um a strong candidate market where they could go and get whoever they wanted because loads of people are out of work that actually the people that we were acquiring still were in jobs and were you know managing notice periods i think the kind of the other you know really interesting example about this is when we're picking a new places to expand into from a talent perspective so for example a really attractive um you know reason why you especially us-based businesses look to expand outside of the us is because the talent is cheaper in to hire software developers, right? Like software developers is the most expensive place in the world to hire software developers in, you know, the, you know, San Francisco, you know, on that, on that Pacific coast in, in the US, right? So soon, even if you look at London, all of a sudden you like, you know, two thirds of the cost to hire a software developer, and that's in London. And then if you start to go into continental Europe, you're starting to look at, you can hire three or four software developers for one software developer. And then, so how can talent acquisition play that as a we you know to actually played an essential kind of part of what you know which country should we be looking at for this what where how are we set up as a business to be able to enable this what are the kind of peaks of using an employer record we had i think 20 or 30 people run through one employer record and that was really tough and that was kind of the maximum that we could manage in that one country at the time um based on that you know because of that relationship with that eor and so it, we had to present to them a full detailed strategy of here are the markets that we currently have operating here are the kind of salaries and the kind of the pros and the cons of each market and be part of that conversation to help them make a decision on what the right strategy was for their expansion outside of the us and i think that's an exact you know i can go into that in a bit more detail but it's a really good opportunity when we're doing these expansions for ta to sit in the driving seat um and in the context of the hr voice and say this is what is and isn't possible based on our live interactions and that data coming from things like linkedin talent insights like this is what we can we can show is the most most attractive market for you to get your business outcome that you're looking for which is which is such a great place to be starting from from a talent strategy perspective I agree. Um, if I could add more with a, a couple of examples, you know, just from my past learnings and current learnings that, you know, I could complement here is I think on a TA side, I think bring our teams up to speed. So communication is key. They have to be looped in. So uh, Matthew, that, that is so critical right from the, from the get go, right? Right. When we start to think about um, you know, global hiring and, you know, how does that take place? Um, I know today uh, at Velocity Global, we are starting to think about going beyond that San Francisco market for our product and technology hiring, you know, uh, uh, to the broader market. So what that means is, of course, you know, we used certain tools, including LinkedIn Talent Insights, you mentioned that earlier, um, Again, based on that talent maturity in an in a location, of course, the cost uh, cost per hire applies. The cost of you know managing these employees that 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 matters too, right? Uh, and it's uh, what what in fact has created is that it's created us uh, opportunities in additional countries beyond the U.S. So multi-continental to achieve our. Uh, whether it's a product enhancements or new future uh, role, feature rollouts, um, and also reduce time to hire by 50%. Um, but uh, to this extent, you know, now we are experts in this field, right? So we look at when we are expanding, we are also thoughtful about, okay, what are the legal and compliance uh, pieces that we need to look at? Um, what are the employment laws, tax regulations, visa requirements? What are the data protection rules and social security systems of each country? right where you hire or perhaps if you're relocating your employees um, so many aspects from a legal and compliance issue aspect like what we think about uh, of course communication and cultural barriers uh, I think we often 
think about or th think beyond, hey, you know, cultural barrier is that something, you know, we, our corporate language is English and is that, uh, is that good from a communication angle and uh, it's no longer a barrier, but I think we need to think about how do we collaborate? Uh, what is our productivity level? What is our performance, our team? How do we make sure that, um, uh, you know, we are set up that, you know, our team members may encounter language differences, misunderstandings, mm -hmm. misinterpretations, right, or, or any sort of conflicts due to different communication styles. So, uh, so, so those norms, values, expectations have to be thought, thoughtful mm -hmm. and uh, be set up up front. Um, so that way it does not lead into frustration, confusion or resentment. Um, the other piece I would think about is time zone differences. You know, from this example, we are starting to think about um, what makes it difficult and what makes it easier to schedule meetings, coordinating, coordinating tasks, and uh, deliver projects on time. Um, and uh, from our people leadership team, you know, uh, our leaders are thinking about employee engagement, retention, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's very closely tied to our sustainability. Is this? Uh, are we? Are we? setting up success, our people set up for success are also setting up all the support system that help our people. So whether it's an office space, whether it's a uh, benefits, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. any sort of uh, 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 perks uh, for that particular location, you know, uh, so we want to make sure that we are enhancing the employee engagement uh, aspect uh, to make sure that uh, we don't get into a higher turnover or churn rate, right, you know, from an attrition angle. Uh, and, uh, but I think the best part is it, it is access, it is giving us access to a larger and a more diverse talent pool, uh, perhaps uh, based on each country, you know, a lower cost. Uh, and, and I do strongly believe that cultural diversity really impacts innovation, right? Because that's that's so important for especially companies that are in the in the tech space when it comes to, you know, product enhancements and new, new, new features. Um, but I do want to... Velocity, do you... Sorry. Oh, so do you have a global, like kind of fully remote but borderless hiring strategy. Is that for all roles of Velocity? I I would say we we're, we're starting to think about. So you know, uh, I know uh, Kelly, you mentioned about remote first workplace, and I want to just start off with that, and then talk about uh, the job families that may not have remote or that may that may not be hundred percent remote. Maybe it may suit at a hybrid uh, or or maybe it's on site, you know, uh, for, for example. So, but we we look at a logic of when when we start to think about um, we have several skill sets, right? Different job families where our employees work in in any of these sort of work models, what we call it. But the competitive advantage for any company is not exactly the work model setup. It is more along how do we set up our talent in this digital world when we are all connected, let's say via Slack or any of those are inter-messaging tool? How do we work the root causes rather than just the barriers? So it's not just removing barriers. We want to make sure the root causes are addressed. Then how do we create a networking culture alongside an innovation culture? So it's not just about um, you know, we are here to build something, innovate, or, or, but how do we make sure that that sense of belonging is there for each and every member, whether they are in the head office or HQ or in a remote office or a remote location, so to speak. Um, so to your question, Matthew, I think we are starting to think about, you know, there are some job families or there, there are some types of skill set and work that may not uh, make it more uh, long-term sustainable when we are not able to meet with each other or when we are not able to have that in-office collaboration. Yeah, so things like sales and potentially even, but uh, would be one that you would probably have a hybrid or at least an in-office kind of environment, but then software development sounds like you're expanding that out to be kind of more of a, a borderless structure. That's correct, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> And we will continue to uh, sort of monitor what works. And uh, so we don't have that uh, defined rule as to, hey, every every job family, you know, we have a multitude of skill set uh, is not following exactly what works for each work models and each job family could be totally unique to, to the mm -hmm. type of work that is, uh, that is being done. Um, and I also look at it as um, it, it's going to come with some challenges, uh, but it's also going to give us more benefits on for both employers and employees. Uh, again, back to that earlier point I said about diverse talent pool and lower cost and cultural diversity mm. 
innovation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It kind of brings us to um, Shakira's question that um, they posted earlier, just saying, what are the key challenges faced by employees and employers in adapting to remote work? And how can these challenges be overcome? So maybe if we just kind of touch upon that one as well, while while we're in this space, um, if we're looking at it from, you know, like a, a pure remote, remote first, um, those challenges, um, maybe Nisha, you can kind of kick us off with this one. From your perspective yeah i think we have to be very thoughtful so i want to talk about from an employer aspect we have to be thoughtful when we are entering a new market let, let it be a location or country you know however we decide right there are uh, several uh, several angles you know different options you could look at uh, from a ta angle you know since we are responsible for hiring we could look at an rpo model or a peo which is a professional employee uh, uh, organization right um, and uh, P and and also eor so there are uh, three larger brackets or groups that i look at um, rpo is for uh, is probably perhaps most beneficial if you um, if your business already has an entity in the country where we are going to expand our hiring and thus um, uh, they're going to recruit uh, RPO models are going to just attach to our in-house talent acquisition and they would uh, help us with accelerating that our recruiting presence and talent attraction pres presence. Whereas PEOs mostly handle the HR functions for businesses that already own entities in that specific location or that country. And the big piece on the EORs is we employ workers on behalf of their client companies without requiring our businesses to open an entity. So if you do not own an entity in, let's say, in, um, in India where you want to employ someone, you need an employer of record and not a PEO. So that's a, uh, that's a, that's a difference that I would think about. For the employees, uh, Matthew, do you want to uh, take on that? You know, what are the things that we challenges that we see? Mm. Today? And I can add to some of the pieces. I think we talked about that slightly um, before. In, yeah. In the, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end with asking a question that will probably uh, lead on to this nicely. But I, from a I mean um, from an internal perspective, if you're looking to hire full time employees, you know, I I my personal kind of perspective is that we should be coming into it and really pushing hiring managers to have quite a strong perspective on the location strategy, you know, for all the reasons that we've we've mentioned, right? Like if you're building teams that are split across multiple offices, um, and they're kind of, you know, then it will make it harder in some respects for them to manage or they have to be more intentional with how they manage and support those teams depending on what their location is and if you're managing a team that's predominantly london based for example but then you have you know four people in another country how are they going to feel kind of re you know siloed if they're if they're not kind of connected and how are we going to support that team um especially if there's kind of a hybrid office kind of relationship um and then i think from a um it also makes sense from a from a talent acquisition perspective to have a single market to focus on. You know, the the more uh, markets we add into our potential talent pool, we're advertising. You know, if we just think about the advertising market at the moment, if we advertise in multiple locations, we're going to get double the number of applicants um, for the for the same job, and that makes it really difficult to even engage with before we've even started to, to look at sourcing. So, um, you know. I for in, at Procore especially was really pushing my my you know my hiring leaders to say and and the team to say look why do you want to hire in London over Dublin or why would you know is there a preference and why would there be a preference even if it's marginal to help direct the efforts of our of our recruiting resources that were very spread thin and this leads me on to my kind of question but you need to like when you are hiring in a borderless way. Like, how do you direct the efforts of your recruiters um, within your team? Because, you know, if you have the entire world to go at for a software developer, how would you, you know, how, what's the, what strategy do you employ to make sure they're not kind of just going after the entire world? Like, how do you start a search for a role at that point? I can, uh, no, great question. So I can definitely uh, hone in on that, you know, particularly you mentioned software developer or software engineering uh, job family, right? So that's a, that's a very... Uh, you know, very high uh, skill uh, skill set, right? You know, so um, we, in fact, uh, uh, we've adopted very much location strategy is uh, is uh, is a key 
piece that relates instead of us going after any country, since we do have the capability to go after uh, and do the hiring in any country. Uh, we operate in 185 countries today. Um, th that's possible, but we also want to be thoughtful. So uh, particularly in product and tech, we recently opened um, a Dublin uh, team. Um, today, they are 100% remote. We don't, we do not have an office today. Um, and uh, the way we looked at how to address to uh, to have that sense of belonging is to make sure that we have a ground level, you know, on on site leader leadership, and I think that helps with ambassador network. That helps with, um, uh, and we today we have about 10, 10 or almost twelve employees there in in Dublin market. So it's a brand new team that's being developed over the last six months. Um, and I would say that the site leadership matters, and that's also going to be helpful for us to decide. Um, our, you know, our employer brand in that market, because we would continue to, we would look at continue to hire for these uh, software development uh, uh, roles for sure. And uh, that's going to help us rewrite, you know, what's our talent attraction strategy. So it's no longer just the hiring team decides, it has to be very much um, addressed from a global site strategy aspect too, right? So it's not just for one particular team, we have to look at okay, what else can uh, can uh, co co locate there, right? Um, and yeah. we also want to make sure it's personalized, or at least try to be personalizable. So, uh, we, uh, it, it, you know, talent attraction it, it's it's like dating, and we know we don't, we would not want to be dating everyone. So, in this case, most importantly, that people in this new market should come for should come work for the organization based on based on why the the how and i think the mission value driven uh you know we have you know, formed new company values um as of last month so those are all very key important messages that we are uh, how we are attracting talent there um so you know i would say the, uh, location strategy is it's a much more uh thoughtful process rather than uh, let's go pick any location because then we are creating uh, to your yeah. early point silos, you know, maybe one or two people in, in certain countries and that's not going to be sustainable. Yeah, I completely agree. I'd love to, I love, you know, even when we have the opportunity to hire anywhere in the world, kind of the question is, you know, should, should we, and how, how should we? And I love, you know, we use the idea of a hub and spoke model at Procore that was really successful. So we had core kind of operational entities that we would then support smaller businesses that were either EORs or kind of, um, uh, entities that we had no more than kind of 10, 15 people attached to it. And that was quite successful. So we had a bigger office that had a really strong culture attached to it. And then we'd fly people to and from these smaller kind of spokes, um, which is quite a common model of expansion. Um, but the, kind of talking about going into a new market getting that leader on the ground as you say and getting that kind of country ambassador relatively early is so important I've, i you know it makes it so much easier from a hiring perspective if you have quite a charismatic quite like a strong person like persona who understands and knows the hiring kind of intricacies of that market we hired a guy at Procore again who was really knowledgeable and really well connected and he was able to bring he met he was basically a recruiter he spent kind of every single day talking to people within dublin um and uh you know eventually we had a huge you know we ended up having a huge team there and he was able to retire that hat and take on a, a different type of role in the business but having a cultural leader was was essential for the success of that build in, yeah that's that's so true even in our space here and uh, i remember in um, in my previous organization, in a large tech organization, where we actually failed in in one of the the, uh, the global hiring expansion, we um, so in this uh, at Velocity Global, we we do expect our site leaders to be ambassadors as well, because we also have to think about how does this uh, location continue to sustain or continue to grow. So we have to think about you know universities or schools' relationship with you know just the local market. How do we become, play that corporate citizenship? Uh, when it comes to how do we give back what, what are what is our responsibility in terms of creating jobs um referring to a previous organization that i worked with in a large tech setup where we expanded to a certain city in italy to expand our speech scientist job family i clearly remember that we actually used the tools we we had the tools to go quickly hire we did uh, amazingly, you know, we had the talent acquisition team. We we hired close to about 16 applied scientists and research scientists uh, rather fast uh, in about three to six months. 
Um, and I remember uh, we we did uh, we were very challenged because we were not prepared uh, to face when when COVID hit us because this was a new location and we completely lost contact with a lot of you know the communication channels were lost when we couldn't support this uh, set of you know 16 member group. Um, uh, when when there were challenges, socioeconomic pieces that that came up, uh, you know. So yeah. I think it's very vital for us to be very thoughtful instead of saying, "Hey, I can go hire anywhere," um, and we can do that yeah. because yes, we probably have an entity there. But think about what are the support systems that will help us and set up our employees uh, for success. I can't agree more. Like especially when business leaders like. Uh, CROs or technology leaders. It's like, well, well, we've got the entity. Why can't we just you know, put someone there? We're like, you know, we've got AORs elsewhere. Why can't we just, you know, hire that person? They're really good. Um, and if you don't think about all of these other, like what they would seem, see as red tape HR kind of admin end up becoming like, really important because it's there for if, if anything breaks, if anything changes and we've got to support, like we've got to be thinking of people first and, you know, and making sure that they're well supported and have really kind of com compelling, you know, infrastructure behind them otherwise they'll they'll be unsuccessful and it'll be kind of a, a kind of a, a loss making endeavor for the business which happens all too often i would say you know a good chunk of of international expansions that i've i've observed i've had significant issues in that expansion process that have ended up you know being a loss making endeavor and it's probably because the business wasn't well prepared to go into that market when they when they started to they didn't understand exactly what they were getting themselves into before before they before they put boots on ground one of the big use cases that Velocity Global uses in the, in our EOR space, uh, many clients come to us primarily for that reason because um, you know some of them expanded on their own and they didn't realize uh, there are so many other pieces that we need to look into it. It's not yeah. just being and making the hire. How do we actually yeah. make sure we can continue to have our presence there? Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting, and I think those kind of actionable insights and and actually you know practical things that people can look to do when they're looking to expand is really really helpful um one thing that would be amazing to kind of go into a little bit more detail on and maybe Matthew I can hand um to you for this one is looking at you know are there any specific platforms tools that you know TA teams can actually start to maybe use when they're at that point when they do want to tap into a global market yeah uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll first like start by doing a plug to hire, you know, there is a lot of really knowledgeable people and uh, I've been approached definitely a few times on hire saying, look, you know, we're looking to put boots on ground in XYZ market, do you have any advice? And, you know, reaching out, to, there are so many people in this three, 5,000 person community, Kelly will give me the exact numbers in a second, I'm sure, that can, that have done this before. So you don't have to make this up from scratch. You know, there, there are people who can, who can help. And so ask the question, you know, get on the community, ask the question, someone will, someone will actually know the answers uh, to, to how to do this in a certain, in almost any market in Europe. I think that the second piece is that, you know, be data driven, um, either through something like Tal LinkedIn Talent Insights is, is super valuable. I can't, I can't stress, that, stress that enough. You know, there's two key pieces that I would look at in LinkedIn Talent Insights. One is the availability of talent in the market. So, you know, typing in the certain skills you're looking for uh, and, uh, you know, the geographies that you're looking to identify and it should be able to give you an availability of market uh, by level, et cetera. But then also how competitive is it for jobs in that market? Um, so how many jobs are listed at any given time and LinkedIn should be able to give you good insights on this. So it's not 100% accurate, but you'll be able to compare and contrast against you know similar data points and all of a sudden have really actionable kind of input. The, the other thing that I would really think about and, and try and speak to people on market or have a strong perspective on before you go into that market is compensation. Um, there are a couple of tools out there, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, but there are a couple of tools out there that have very good by country compensation data but if if kind of talent is being led by comp and bends often we'll end up kind of receiving a lower salary than it'll actually be or they're not ready yet we've had a few times where I, like you know the comp and bends team haven't had salary set for certain locations and what is our compensation philosophy outside of outside of the, the kind of the, the hq because you don't want to get to a point where you're at offer and then the business is like no no we're never going to pay that much money and you've done all this effort to try and bring people along on that journey and convince them that they're worth taking the risk that we're worth taking the risk on um and then for all of a sudden you know you can't get kind of salary and the, and the, you know and stuff over the line it's so it's really big and really important to get that done you know 
if I remember expansion into Cairo at Procore, we were um, really far apart with our Compa Benz team to what was actually happening on the market. And it was on the talent acquisition team to talk to, you know, I'm not kidding, like 100 plus people and identify what the different salaries were by level to be able to say and present back to our president of technology saying, if you're trying to hire this many people in Cairo, you need to change your salaries. And this is what the current data on the market gives you. And again, that's the power that talent acquisition could play in the strategy of our global expansion. And we have to, you know, be proactive in thinking about those data points, uh, because if we are not data led, you know, business leaders are going to go with kind of what their gut is and what, the, you know, what they kind of, what their instinct is in their expansion strategy. Yeah, I would, I would also add LinkedIn Talent Insights. That's a great tool, Matthew. Uh, we, we've used it and we use it today too. Um, and the additional tool that I've used in the past is DRAUP, D-R-A-U-P. Uh, uh, they've come a long way. And I would say that's definitely a tool that we use primarily in our engineering market space because we can still break it down to um, several types of job titles that serves the engineering job families. Um, a few other pieces that I would look at, you know, as we start to think about future of, you know, our uh, future of hiring, right? Like, uh, I do believe that our recruiters should be trained, our TA professionals should be trained about, about compliance and uh, with international hiring regulations and requirements, because I do think that's a piece that t uh, today our uh, TA professionals uh, you know, we have a large dependency when it comes to our internal experts to figure out, hey, what is the type of, especially with the, the rising uh, uh, age of gig economy, right? There, there are different multitude of employment types that affect um, international hiring, whether it's a contractor, whether it's a seasonal worker, whether it's a fixed term contract, many, many different types of uh, employment types. Um, and from a TA angle, I look at, you know, are there language barriers that could be an issue? Like in, in Germany or Netherlands, you know, I, I, we always make sure that, you know, we have folks who uh, are very comfortable with uh, the local languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the cultural norms in our target markets? And, and, how, and, and from a TA angle, we also look at how will we promote these job openings? Uh, it may not be that LinkedIn is that, um, as uh, TA uh, relates to that all jobs have to show up on LinkedIn. It may be that uh, there's a very specific local uh, job board that is very predominantly used in that country or in that locale. Um, and of course, you know, local professional networks that can use to source, uh, we can use to source talent, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are some, some additional uh, tools and tips and tricks, yeah. Out of interest, what's your philosophy on advertising in the local geography language rather than in English, if you, that's your business language? We are looking into it. I'm a huge uh, uh, advocate for local language advertisement. Um, I, I think there's a question about tools and integration with our applicant tracking system today. That's, uh, that's quite a limit, uh, but we are, we are looking into that uh, for sure. Um, I do know there are some jobs um, um, in my previous organizations that we actually uh, posted the job or advertised it both in English and the local language. Uh, and that was legally the, required in some countries, I think, as yeah, well. Legally required. So we are definitely looking at I think there are today there are some challenges along what are the language uh, tools, uh, you know, la uh, translation tools that we have, which can be easily integrated with our uh, applicant tracking system if we have that already going so uh, mm -hmm. but we are quickly going to see a lot more available tools in in those in those areas but yeah that's a great question yeah it's a really good point because as you said Matthew there are countries that you you legally do have to advertise in both mm -hmm. languages and I think kind of comes back to that compliance piece even if you're looking at um <laughs> expanding into the states for example where in some states you have to disclose salaries versus you know other states so there's a whole um piece around you know ensuring that that compliance side of things is um kind of front of mind with the ta team as well if i was to add like one point to this is to as you go into new countries to document everything 
like super detailed you know ideally as a talent acquisition leader i want any of my recruiters to be able to work on any market relatively comfortable and there should be a plethora of like insights and um, available to them through the existing employees and recruiters who've gone into that market and have experience in working in their market because if they are ill or whatever it is and they, we need someone else to cover or they're they're overloaded with work we'd want other people from other parts of the world to be able to cover that work uh, and if it's not documented if they don't know how to kind of manage an offer or how to or what the regulation and rules are there's not a cheat sheet on how to hire in you know france versus the us you know that's on us as kind of recruiting organizations to ensure that's our responsibility we need to make sure that that's really well documented and it's also just good kind of practice so as if you're doing this for the first time now and it's something that's on your cheat sheet or you don't have it documented already i would it's I would say it's probably one of your top top next tasks yeah i love that almost just creating that that playbook for folks in the business. Um, on your point around compensation and benefits, what I'll do after the webinar is I will link to two of our previous webinars. So we've done one specifically around comp and ben, but also last week um, we were looking at unlocking success with hypergrowth and we had um, the CPO of Rabio on the call talking around compensation philosophy. So I will link those after, um, just I was gonna say on the show notes, if it makes it sound like I'm <laughs> running a podcast, um, but I'll link them below for anyone who wants to kind of revisit and do a little bit more of a deeper dive into the comps and Ben side of things. Um, we're almost at time. Is there any kind of, I guess, parting words of wisdom or advice that we haven't covered from that kind of expansion piece, that practical side of things for any kind of TA and HR folk that are maybe at that early stage who are, who are watching today? I mean, I can jump in and say global hiring is inevitable. It is, it is happening. We need to embrace it. Um, it, it creates that sense of uh, it addresses inclusivity. It's it was spoken in our large uh, in in our last World Economic Forum, uh, the future of hiring. That global hiring was a key topic uh, for many of the leaders there. Uh, the sustainability aspect is let's be more thoughtful uh, because in sustainability is very tied to how we prepare uh, in order to make sure that. Um, these locations where we've hired continue to grow if that's that's our business strategy yeah yeah I couldn't agree couldn't agree more uh you know it's all going to be part of every recruiter's job to hire in multiple countries in the coming years um but it's also you know in this time of uncertainty and you know the role of talent acquisition in businesses is a really good opportunity for us to be the value add to the business right to help drive some of the strategy to not just be a reactive kind of taker of 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 requisitions and requests it's to be able to help drive our business strategy forward and help build a better business and 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 as a result we can have you know a longer lasting impact and and a better seat at the table for when kind of changes happen amongst the company so you know uh embrace it it's going to happen and and yet to lose, use this as an opportunity to really kind of position ourselves as strategic advisors amazing well it's been brilliant having you both on I think there's been lots of amazing insights and, and nuggets that we've got through in this conversation as well so really thank you so much for your time because I know you know it's it's a lot of time talking we've gone deep into the subject um but for anyone who is watching um just in terms of next week like I said we have these webinars every Wednesday same time same place unless uh your time zone hasn't changed I know it hasn't changed in the US this week so it's it started at 9 a.m. San Francisco time instead of 8 a.m. this week. But next week, um, we've got a webinar all around inclusive hiring. Um, and we've got Danny joining us, who's going to talk around ways to minimize bias in hiring. So that will be at 4 o'clock UK time and then back to 8 a.m. Um, PST time as well. So do join us then if, um, if you would like. We'll also have everything on a replay as always. So if you ever miss a webinar or you ever want to go back and re-watch, sometimes you might want to take notes. There's a lot of um, great insight that does come out of them. Um, and like I said, just in terms of hire, um, we are a global community. We've got um, 11,000 plus members at the moment and growing, uh, which is great. But um, you can head on over to hirehq.com if you would like to join us. Like I said, we've got lots of extra conversations going on inside the Slack community, but we also run in-person events. We run virtual roundtables um, as well as our webinars and podcasts. So there's, there's lots going 
on, um, no matter kind of what stage you are at in your kind of HR um, and TA journey, we have things for, you know, individual contributors all the way up to um, our executive community as well. Um, but on that note, thank you both so much uh, for joining us. And um, I'm sure we'll be seeing you and talking to you soon um, and have lovely rest of your Wednesdays. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Cheers. Bye.